Hey, Deep Divers, welcome back for another Deep Dive with us. Today, um, we're going to be tackling a question that's both mind-boggling and honestly a little bit freaky. What does consciousness look like in nature, and does it mean animals deserve to be treated as persons? So buckle up, because we're going to be going on a wild ride through evolution and philosophy and even a little bit of alien intelligence. Seriously, you do not want to miss this. And hey, while you're at it, uh, why not hit that like button and subscribe so you never miss a deep dive? All right, so before we uh, start pondering whether we should be inviting dolphins over for tea and crumpets or, you know, whatever dolphins eat, we need to lay down some groundwork. And luckily, I've got a brilliant expert with me today who can help us navigate this mind-bending topic. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, let's get this deep dive started. First things first, to even wrap our heads around animal consciousness, we need to rewind the evolutionary clock way, way back. Think billions of years. That's right. We're going way back. You see, while life on Earth is thought to have emerged around 3.49 billion years ago, the complex animal life we're interested in the kind that goes beyond simple sponges. It didn't really explode onto the scene until much later. We're talking about the Cambrian explosion, which happened roughly 540 million years ago. Okay, the Cambrian explosion. Sounds traumatic. What exactly happened? It was a period of rapid diversification with a sudden burst of new and complex life forms appearing. And here's the kicker. This burst seems to have coincided with the development of sophisticated sensory systems like eyes. Wait, so all these critters suddenly got eyeballs and started checking each other out. <laughs> I bet things got interesting fast. You could say that. Imagine suddenly being able to see the world around you. It would revolutionize how you interact with your environment and other creatures. It's like someone flipped a switch and suddenly life got a whole lot more complex. Okay, so we've got eyes, and I'm guessing that means everyone was suddenly a lot more aware of who might be trying to eat them. Right, exactly. This new ability to see and sense the world meant that predation became a major driving force in evolution. Animals had to become quicker more coordinated to both catch prey and avoid ending up as someone else's lunch. This looks like a prehistoric arms race, right? <laughs> Develop amazing senses and ninja-like reflexes or get eaten. That's a great way to put it. And that's where we see this classic animal combo emerging action on a multicellular scale. Animals evolved hard exoskeletons for protection and their sensory and motor systems became increasingly specialized. This is fascinating. So we've got this incredible diversity of life exploding onto the scene, driven by this need to sense and respond to the world. Yeah. But I have to ask, did everyone just start getting smarter and smarter at the same pace? Well, it's not quite that straightforward. Evolution isn't a single linear progression. One of the most important things to remember is that behavioral complexity evolved multiple times along different branches of the evolutionary tree. So different animal groups figured out different ways to be brainy. Precisely. And that's why it's so fascinating to compare the evolution of nervous systems and behavior across different groups. Take arthropods, for example. Insects, crustaceans, spiders. They were early powerhouses with their hard exoskeletons and incredibly diverse ways of interacting with the world. Arthropods. Those are some serious survivors. But what about other groups? Didn't you mention something about octopuses earlier? Ah, uh, yes. Octopuses and their cephalopod cousins are a prime example of how evolution can take some pretty wild turns. They represent a completely different path to complex behavior and potentially consciousness. Okay, now we're talking. I've heard some seriously strange things about octopus intelligence. Are we going to get to that later? We are. Cephalopods are a fantastic example of how vastly different evolutionary paths can lead to incredibly complex behavior and maybe even consciousness. Okay, I'm hooked. But before we get to those eight-armed wonders, I need a little more background. Of course. So in addition to arthropods and mollusks, we have vertebrates, our own lineage. Vertebrates, starting with fish, eventually led to all those land-dwelling animals, and they developed a more centralized nervous system with a greater capacity for different kinds of movement. Okay, so we've got three major branches, arthropods, mollusks, vertebrates, each with their own unique evolutionary path and style of intelligence. This is blowing my mind. But how do we even define intelligence in animals? And at what point does intelligence cross over to consciousness? That is the million dollar question. And that's where things get really complicated and where philosophers enter the scene in a big way. All right, deep divers, let's get philosophical. But please, let's keep it simple enough for us regular folks to follow along. Absolutely. So think of it this way. There are two main camps when it comes to understanding consciousness. Two camps. Okay, give me the rundown. The first camp, let's call them the narrow pathway, Folks argue that consciousness is a very rare and recent evolutionary development. 
They say it requires very specific brain structures, the kind found only in humans and maybe a handful of other super smart animals. So they're saying we're pretty special in the consciousness department. Exactly. And they often point to research on things like blind sight as evidence. You see, there are people with certain brain injuries who can actually react to visual stimuli without consciously seeing them. It's like their brains are processing the information, but they're not aware of it. Wait, so they're basically zombies. That's freaky. Well, not quite zombies, but it does suggest that we can do some pretty complex things without being consciously aware of them. And for the narrow pathway folks, this supports the idea that consciousness is like an extra layer added on top of already sophisticated cognitive processes, something that evolved quite recently. OK, I'm following so far, but you said there are two camps, right? What's the other side of this debate? I'm ready for my mind to be blown. Yeah. All right, get ready. The other camp takes a much broader view of consciousness. They argue that consciousness in some form might be far more widespread in the animal kingdom than we typically assume. So they're saying we're not so special after all. Not necessarily. It's more that they challenge the assumption that consciousness looks the same in every species. We can't just project our human experience onto other animals and assume they experience the world in the same way. Okay, that makes sense. It's like we're trying to judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. Exactly. There could be radically different forms of consciousness out there, forms we don't even recognize because they're so unlike our own. I love this. It's like there might be entire worlds of subjective experience happening right under our noses. We're totally missing them because we're looking for something that looks like human consciousness. You've got it. Yeah. And there are also some intriguing in-between positions. Some scientists and philosophers argue that consciousness isn't an on or off switch, but rather spectrum. A spectrum of consciousness. Okay, now things are getting really trippy. Think of it this way. Different species might have different degrees of awareness and subjectivity. There might be shades of consciousness that we don't even have the tools to measure yet. So it's not a question of conscious or not conscious, but rather how conscious. My brain is officially doing backflips. It's a complex and fascinating topic. And to really understand the possibilities, we need to look at some concrete examples. And I think I know just the creatures to showcase the strangeness and wonder of consciousness in nature. I think you're right. Let's talk about octopuses. All right. Deep divers get ready for a deep dive into the mind of an octopus. These creatures are seriously mind bending and they challenge everything we think we know about intelligence and consciousness. Octopuses are a perfect example of what we call alien intelligence, a type of intelligence that evolved completely independently from our own lineage. They offer a glimpse into a world of cognition that's fundamentally different from anything we're familiar with. OK, alien intelligence. That's a pretty awesome way to put it. I mean, they yeah. can change color and shape like something out of a sci-fi movie. And they seem so curious and playful, it's almost like they're messing with you sometimes. Yes, many people who've interacted with octopuses both in the wild and in captivity describe the sense of mutual engagement almost like there's someone in there looking back at you. Okay, I'm getting chills. So let's crack open the octopus brain, so to speak. What's going on in those cephalopod craniums that makes them so different? Well, the first thing to understand is that an octopus's nervous system is radically different from ours. It's decentralized, which means that two thirds of its neurons are distributed throughout its arms, not concentrated in its brain like in vertebrates. Wait, hold on. You're telling me their arms are like little brains? In a way, yes. Each arm has a remarkable degree of autonomy. They can sense their surroundings, make decisions, and even initiate actions without direct input from the central brain. It's almost like each arm has a mind of its own. OK, that's both amazing and a little creepy, but it gets even weirder. Right. Didn't you mention something about their skin? Ah, yes. Their skin is truly remarkable. It's more than just camouflage. Octopuses have these specialized pigment cells called chromatophores, which they can control with incredible precision. Each chromatophore is surrounded by tiny muscles that can expand or contract, changing the cell's size and shape, which alters its color. Right. I've seen videos of octopuses changing color and texture in the blink of an eye. It's like watching a living, breathing special effect. And here's the truly mind-blowing part. Their skin also contains light-sensing cells. Whoa, wait a minute. Are you saying they can see with their skin? It seems that way. It's not like they're forming images with their skin, but they can sense the brightness and color of their surroundings even when their eyes are covered. It's like their entire body is one giant distributed sensory organ. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Officially blown away. <laughs> They've got decentralized brains in their arms. They can see with their skin. They're masters of disguise. Mm. It's like they were designed by a committee of science fiction writers. Their biology is truly remarkable, and it raises all sorts of questions about how they experience the world. Exactly. And I think that brings us to the heart of today's deep dive. We've explored the evolution of animal minds. We've marveled at the alien intelligence of octopuses. And now it's time to tackle the big question. If animals are capable of such complex behavior, potentially even conscious experience, does that change our ethical obligations toward them? Do they deserve to be considered persons? That is a question that has puzzled philosophers and ethicists for centuries. And as we learn more about the cognitive abilities of animals, it becomes even more pressing. Right. I mean, we've traditionally thought of personhood as something that's unique to humans. But if an octopus with its decentralized brain and alien lifestyle can demonstrate such sophisticated behavior, it really challenges that assumption. It does indeed. And it forces us to re-examine our relationship with the natural world. What does it mean to be a person? What qualities or capacities grant moral status? These are big, complex questions with no easy answers. So where do we even begin to unpack all of this? Well, I think it's helpful to start by clarifying what we mean by personhood. Typically, it's understood to have both moral and legal dimensions. Okay, break it down for us. Morally, personhood implies that a being has certain inherent rights and deserves our ethical consideration. Legally, it's about who has the right to make decisions and have their interests represented in a court of law. So if we were to grant personhood to an animal, it would mean acknowledging that they have moral standing and potentially even legal rights similar to what humans have. Exactly. It would be a profound shift in how we view and interact with other species. It would have far-reaching implications for everything from our food systems to scientific research to how we treat animals in our everyday lives. That's a huge shift. And it raises a whole bunch of thorny questions, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Like, which animals would qualify? Do all animals deserve personhood or just those that are considered intelligent or conscious? Those are precisely the questions we need to grapple with. There are no easy answers. And the science of animal cognition is still evolving. We're only just beginning to understand the incredible diversity of minds that exist in nature. This is definitely a lot to think about. And it makes me wonder, if we start acknowledging the possibility of personhood in other animals, how might that change our relationships with them? Could we move beyond a purely utilitarian view of animals as resources to be exploited and embrace a more respectful and compassionate way of coexisting? That's a wonderful question and one that I think each of us needs to ponder. It challenges us to expand our circle of compassion and recognize the interconnectedness of all life. And it reminds us that there's still so much we don't know about the natural world and the incredible beings that share this planet with us. Absolutely. The more we learn about animal cognition and the diversity of consciousness in nature, the more we realize how much we have yet to discover. Well, Deep Divers, this Deep Dives has only given me a lot to chew on. And I hope it sparks some curiosity and wonder in you as well. It feels like we've just scratched the surface of this incredibly complex and fascinating topic. We have, but that's the beauty of it. There's always more to explore, more to learn, and more to wonder about when it comes to the nature of consciousness and our place in the web of life. Speaking of wonder, I keep thinking back to that idea you mentioned earlier, the idea that consciousness might not be a binary on or off switch, but rather a spectrum. Could you unpack that a little more for us? It's such a mind-bending concept. Absolutely. It's a challenging idea to grasp because we humans tend to think in categories. We like clear boundaries and definitions. But when it comes to consciousness, it seems nature doesn't play by our rules. So what you're saying is that consciousness might exist in shades of gray, not just black and white. Precisely. Think about it this way. Even within our own species, there are variations in levels of awareness and subjective experience. Mm -hmm. We have different personalities, different ways of perceiving the world, different depths of feeling and understanding. That's true. I mean, some people are super introspective and analytical, while others are more spontaneous and emotionally driven. Exactly. And now imagine extending that spectrum beyond our own species. What if other animals experience the world in ways we can barely imagine? What if their forms of consciousness are so different from our own that we've completely overlooked them? It's mind-boggling, but also incredibly exciting. It opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for understanding life on this planet. It's like we're just beginning to glimpse the true diversity of minds out there. It is exciting, isn't it? And it also makes the collision of personhood even more complex and nuanced. If consciousness exists on a spectrum, where do we draw the line? What criteria do we use to determine who deserves moral consideration and legal protection? 
Those are some tough questions, and I imagine there are a lot of different perspectives out there on how to approach them. There are, yeah. and that's why it's so important to have open and honest conversations about these issues. We need to listen to different viewpoints, consider the scientific evidence, and engage with the ethical implications of our expanding understanding of animal minds. It's definitely a conversation that's only going to become more relevant as we continue to learn about the amazing diversity of life on this planet. I agree. It's a journey of discovery and one that requires both intellectual curiosity and a willingness to challenge our own assumptions. Well said. A huge thank you to our expert for sharing their insights and expertise today. This has been a truly mind-expanding journey. And to our amazing deep divers out there, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the mysteries of consciousness and nature. Remember to like and subscribe to The Deep Dive for more adventures into the depths of knowledge. And keep those brains buzzing. The world is full of wonder waiting to be discovered.